Hey folks, it's Cameron Nixon, and today we're going to chat about hail forecasting. Um, large hail, uh, along with uh, tornadoes and damaging winds, are kind of amongst the big three um, severe convective hazards um, to hit the U.S. every year. And um, while tornadoes especially have gotten a lot of attention um, in research and in operations and in the, the tools that we develop um, to try to forecast it, Hail really is a relatively newer science, especially in the U.S. We have a lot less tools and a lot less of a kind of conceptual model um, of how to actually forecast it. I mean, a lot of people don't actually really know in detail how hail actually forms, um, whereas a lot of us uh, have learned either in, in uh, our undergraduate degree or elsewhere how tornadoes form uh, within a supercell. Um, so hail is kind of the, the younger, more misunderstood child uh, of um, the severe weather trio here. Um, so we're going to talk about it here and, and how, uh, especially over the last decade, um, hail research has really advanced. Um, and this is in large part to all the wonderful people uh, that I've listed here um, who've been my friends and co-workers during this process. Um, so while I'll actually be sharing a lot of my own research that I've done through my four-year PhD here, um, I'm actually going to be showing a lot of work um, and kind of foundational background um, from all of these people here. Um, so be sure to uh, search them on Google Scholar or through AMS um, because they have some awesome uh, papers um, that I'll be relying on uh, for this presentation. So why are we talking about hail? Well, hail deals over $10 billion in damage every year in the United States. I mean, so these are expensive things like um, car windshields or, or roofs or solar panels or crops. Um, tons of things um, that are just sitting out there just waiting to get pelted on by hail um, are very vulnerable um, and very expensive. And so hail really is a menace to our economy here. Um, and so, you know, as, as someone in the National Weather Service, um, your slogan might be, right, the protection of life and property. And although hail doesn't get as bad of a rap in terms of the life part of this slogan, um, it definitely um, deals a significant problem um, to this property portion. Um, and so we know that billion dollar hail events are actually on the rise, uh, both due to climate change and due to the expanding bullseye effect, um, right? This was the uh, Ashley et al. Um, scenario where you have a, a tornado swath here. I mean, as our, our cities get bigger and bigger, this swath then impacts more and more of your city. Um, so as our cities expand, I'm definitely looking at you, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, our hail swaths uh, can deal a lot more damage um, than what our city was like in kind of the 1950s. So the problem with big hail is that we think we know how to predict it. Um, even after a few decades of kind of using the same workflow, um, and so oftentimes you'll see maybe huge cape uh, being associated with the hail potential, right? Um, something like this, where you have a, a big separation between your parcel path and your environmental temperature. You have lots of buoyancy here. Um, and, and people think that we need that really intense buoyancy um, to be good for hail. Um, maybe steep lapse rates, right, is associated with hail, uh, where temperature decreases quickly with height. Maybe if we don't exactly know why um, this is the case, um, steep lapse rates are associated with hail in the U.S. Um, maybe a low freezing level, right? A lot of people intuitively think that the colder it is, the lower the freezing level there is, um, the higher the chance uh, that we could get hail and that it will reach the ground without melting. Um, and last but not least, we might need a discrete supercell, right? With a, a snazzy looking photograph like this one. But let's take a look at an actual record hail sounding. This was from the Hondo, Texas uh, hailstorm back in 2021. Um, this dealt Texas's largest hailstone ever observed. And let's take a look at it. We got kind of a moderate amount of cape here. We have kind of meager lapse rates, especially in the mid-levels. Our cape is a little bit skinny. Uh, we have a kind of high LCL here, large temp dew point spreads, um, effective infill air, SRH, really nothing to write home about. Long, straight, photograph, weak level shear, maybe even a little bit of backing aloft. So, what's so special about this? That's what we're going to talk about through the rest of this presentation. So in this training, we're going to cover a few things. First, how does hail actually grow and what, what's, what's physically necessary for hail formation? Um, a lot of folks have that, that ingrained conceptual model of tornado genesis, um, but hail production might be a little bit more fuzzy. 
Um, and then what's in a hail environment? What are the kind of parameters that we should be looking for to kind of back this physical process that, hey, hail is, is possible today? Um, and last but not least, we're going to go through some case studies. So what do we need to get large hail? Well, hail is kind of a mass problem. The more hydro meteors you have, the more mass, the more precipitation you have within your storm, the more of that can go toward creating hail embryos or little ice nuclei um, that can serve as kind of the, the source points for the conglomeration of a lot of um, precipitation onto that ice nucleus and uh, ultimately grow larger and larger and larger. Um, so generally, the more mass that we could put into this, the more mass that we could get out of this in terms of hail. And so generally we want storms that are broader, right? And have more mass to them and perhaps more precipitation as well. Um, so a lot of us actually think that low precipitation supercells are really good for hail. And we, we might actually see this, especially out in the high plains. Um, LP supercells can be prolific hail producers, um, but our, our storms that really produce the highest quantity of hail and the potential for our biggest stones tend to be a little bit larger um, and tend to produce a little bit more precip. Um, and we also know that overshooting top height um, is a really good predictor for hail and that deeper storms uh, might be more um, capable of producing larger hail. So this is kind of a proportions problem, right? Broader and deeper, wider and taller. Um, the more mass that your storm has, the more mass that can go into hail production. But last but not least, we need to spend the most time in the hail growth zone as we possibly can. And this is kind of the temperature region in the mid-levels of the atmosphere that has kind of been defined as the most favorable for hail growth. Um, somewhere between negative 10 and negative 30 degrees Celsius, um, but it might extend a little bit higher than that. And so this is kind of the region that we want our stone to spend the most time in because this is the region that's most optimal for its growth. So one of the biggest misconceptions about the physics required for hail formation is that we need a really strong updraft in our storm. And, you know, that's, that's obviously found in science, right? The bigger your stone is, the more vertical motion that you need to hold it aloft and keep it from falling down because gravity exists. But this doesn't actually work the same way with hail embryos or those little itty bitty baby hailstones because these stones are really small. They don't have a lot of mass, and so they don't need a really intense updraft to hold them aloft. And so when you're first forming these hailstones, if you have a really strong updraft, especially below that hill growth zone, you're just going to shoot them straight through and right out of that hill growth zone, and they're not going to have any time to grow, right? They don't spend time within that hill growth zone, so they can't grow. So on the contrary, though, let's say you had a pretty weak updraft below that hill growth zone and most of your updraft was kind of confined to just above it. Now you could have a lot slower of a speed through your updraft and your stone can kind of lollygag through your updraft here. Um, and as it does that, as it spends time within the storm, it can grow and then we can fall back down as, as really large stones. So this ends up being a residence time problem. Residence time can be lengthened, most simply, by just having a lower freezing level, right? The lower our freezing level is, the more time in this kind of arc here um, that our stone has in favorable temperatures below freezing, right? Hail is an ice particle. It needs ice and it needs the most time um, that we could spend within cold temperatures um, to produce hail. And likewise, having a storm on top of a mountain or higher terrain naturally lowers that freezing level. Um, so this is a reason why hail is so um, common, not only in kind of the high plains and the higher terrain here in the U.S., but also along the Appalachian mountain range. This is kind of a, a sneaky secondary target here um, where a lot of hail actually forms. Um, and so this is really just showing you that hail is most common in the higher terrain. Um, that's, that's very likely because of this problem here. Um, and it's a proportions problem, right? The, the deeper and the broader your updraft is, the more kind of real estate that your stone will have um, within that hill growth zone and within the updraft um, for it to spend more time in it and grow. But residence time can actually be shortened by having too much momentum. 
Um, and so first we'll talk about vertical momentum, right? If we have too strong of an updraft, especially below the freezing level, this is how you get stones that really shoot straight through that hill growth zone and don't have any time to grow. Likewise, what else could induce a really strong updraft? Something like a strong mesocyclone, right? A really intense mesocyclone induces our upward pressure perturbations, and we get a very strong level updraft that similarly inhibits hail production. Um, and this is something that the IBHS uh, hail study has actually found uh, when they're out there surveying hail production in these storms. Um, and they're actually finding that when, uh, uh, when uh, supercells go tornadic, hail production actually ceases during the tornado, um, which is really cool. And, and really, the physical process here at play, um, at least we think, is that our updraft is, is too strong in the low levels here and really hostile uh, for the formation of uh, hail embryos. Um, but horizontal momentum is also an issue in hail production. We'll talk about this a lot more later because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but this is when we're dealing with storm relative winds. And the stronger our storm relative winds are, um, the less uh, residence time that our stone will have within that storm. So traditionally, we're used to parameters like CAPE. Um, maybe even the most savvy of us use CAPE in the hail growth zone. Um, lapse rates, uh, freezing level, and uh, bulk shear here. And so this is what the environments of hailstorms um, look like on kind of the mean basis here. Uh, we're looking at uh, sub-severe, severe, sig-severe, and giant hail here. Um, and you can see as we toggle through these, all these parameters do um, kind of increase or become more favorable, um, uh, perhaps with the exception of freezing level. Um, but we see a greater cape here, um, we see greater bulk shear, um, and we see steeper lapse rates uh, as hail size increases. So it's no surprise that these parameters um, are rather intuitive um, that we've been using them uh, over the last couple decades. Um, but today we're going to talk about some new concepts that are a little bit more ingrained kind of with the, the physics of how hail actually does form within a storm. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, buoyancy, especially below the hill growth zone. Uh, we're going to talk about updraft width and updraft depth, right, that proportions problem. Um, and then we're going to talk about storm relative winds, um, which is part of that momentum problem. So when talking about buoyancy, we need to first kind of ask ourselves the philosophical question of what is CAPE, actually? Uh, because CAPE is the maximum potential energy that a rising parcel can ever hope to achieve out of this given environment here. Um, in reality, you have something called dry air entrainment, which is dry air that gets into a storm um, through kind of convective overturning and turbulence um, within that updraft here. And dry air entrainment can dilute a storm's updraft and kind of effectively reduce the amount of cape that it has um, and the obviously how, how strong that updraft can be in return. Um, However, John Peters has found recently that stronger shear can support broader updrafts that are more resistant to entrainment. Um, so this is to say that buoyancy doesn't just depend on cape, right? If you, if you want to understand how buoyant the atmosphere is or how much, how much energy that an updraft has, it, cape is just a, a really rough estimate um, and, and that also depends on the relative humidity of the background profile and how strong our deep layer shear is. So coming very soon to the forecast process, um, I know it's already been kind of worked into um, some storm prediction center forecasts, but is this new parameter called ECAPE. Um, and so ECAPE is something that Peter's developed um, to better take into account all three of these factors then in how much buoyancy an updraft has. And so uh, as we'll kind of get at throughout this presentation, ECAPE is going to be very important for hail production and kind of something that we need to assume already um, in terms of um, what does our buoyancy profile actually look like? How much buoyancy do we have? Where is it? Um, and how tall could our storm get here? Um, so ECAPE is going to be very important as it starts rolling out. Um, and uh, we, we thank uh, Peters a lot uh, for his contribution to this. But so far, let's say you don't have something like eCape just floating around in your toolbox. Um, we can also go back to the fundamentals, right? Um, so we're, we're actually going to um, subset our hail environments here um, just to our significant severe stones here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to toggle and change how dry the low-level profile is. And you can see as we make our profile more dry here, we need a lot more cape, right? Our, our cape bounces up at least 600 joules here. 
And so when we're drier, we just need more K because we need to overcome all that dry air entrainment here. And likewise, when you have weaker shear, we also need a lot more cape, right? Um, stronger shear, it makes us more resistant to entrainment, so we need a lot less cape to produce the same result. Um, so when you're in a really um, strong shear environment, you don't need as much cape, similarly, uh, to produce big hail. So what this turns out to be is kind of a, a Goldilocks problem um, between cape, shear, and relative humidity, all three of which go into this EK parameter, um, which is going to be really useful for us in the future. Um, and so as you can see here, when we have really weak shear, and then when we have really dry tropospheres here, we need a lot more cape here. Those are these, these darker values here to produce hail. Um, but when we have really strong shear and really high relative humidity, such that entrainment really isn't an issue, we don't need much cape in the first place uh, because we don't have a lot of entrainment. Um, so th this, this kind of works out as this, this pleasing kind of um, optimal value here throughout um, where it's very likely that um, large hail simply requires kind of an optimal value of e-cape. Um, something that is based on all three of these parameters here. But where the buoyancy is distributed is first and foremost in hail prediction, right? Because we know that buoyancy kind of aloft or above the hail growth zone um, is generally good um, for this process. Um, but buoyancy below the hail growth zone, especially too much buoyancy, um, can kind of have a detrimental effect and kind of negate uh, from the rest of the profile. Um, so, a common feature of, of classic hail soundings um, that we've been finding in our research is basically having a low freezing level uh, with respect to your LFC. Um, and what this does is this minimizes the buoyancy you have below that hail growth zone. And there's a lot of ways that you could do this, right? You might have um, a really strong capping inversion here, lots of sin, kind of your classic Great Plains sounding um, with a high LFC uh, relative to your freezing level. Um, you might just have a low freezing level to begin with. This might be kind of your off season um, where naturally a lower freezing level is going to minimize the buoyancy below it. Um, maybe you're just a higher elevation, like a, a Denver sounding here, um, where you, again, naturally have lower buoyancy beneath the freezing level. Um, or maybe you have a high LCL. This might be more something like a West Texas sounding, um, where your LCL height is very high, which is also going to push your LFC height high, which is going to remain right below your freezing level. So, right, you can see all these soundings um, have that same common theme of a freezing level and an LFC quite close together. Um, a, a really common way to get hail environments is actually with these elevated storm scenarios uh, where you have kind of an, an elevated parcel here. Um, maybe you're a, a lot lifted above kind of a stable layer here. Um, and so you're not really feeling these, these low level profiles very much. Your updraft is only beginning um, in the mid levels of the atmosphere. Um, so in this case, again, uh, you'd have minimal buoyancy um, below your freezing level. Um, so let's contrast that with something like this. Does this look like a classic hail sounding? Not exactly. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later about how we could actually still make it one. So secondly, let's talk about updraft width. We're starting to get into that proportions problem, right? Where broader updrafts uh, can produce larger hail. Um, so it would obviously behoove us then to predict updraft width. So how do we do that? Well, one of the most important facets of this is the storm relative inflow, as Peters has found. And this is kind of what works its way into that EK parameterization. Um, storm relative inflow is that vector between your right moving storm motion here and the low levels of the hodograph. And pretty intuitively, if we have stronger inflow, we actually have more mass flux going into your storm, um, which basically helps it to grow. Uh, the more mass flux into your storm, um, the faster that it can grow larger. And so generally then, stronger inflow can support broader updrafts that can produce more hail. Um, so this is kind of a, a comparison between what you might expect um, from two different hodograph shapes. One of them, you see we have really strong or weak storm relative inflow. This might only be supportive of, say, mini supercells, kind of like what you see in kind of the late summer months um, in the Midwest and maybe even the Southeast. Um, or maybe you have a hodograph with really strong storm relative inflow. This is how you can better support your much larger supercells. Um, so this is going to be really important when it comes to hail prediction, because bigger and more massive storms can generally produce larger hail.
But there is kind of a, a X factor in all of this, and that is cell mergers. Because regardless of our storm relative inflow, cell mergers can make wider updrafts, right? The more mergers you put together, the more updraft mass you throw together, the bigger your storm can be in the long run. And so you can see in this loop, as soon as these storms collide, you see that big um, uptick in hail mass here and those, those pinks here. Um, and so this is not a coincidence, right? As soon as you kind of throw multiple updrafts together, you get a sudden uptick in, in mass and, and more ability to produce hail. Um, so, and, and mergers can briefly trigger a, a greater hail threat. You can see um, how we initially had one cell here, um, and then a merger came along here, and as soon as they kind of got together here, this is where you got your three-inch hail, um, and then we produced a tornado uh, shortly after this. Um, so, mergers do pose kind of a, a um, situational issue um, that when you see these coming, we should be a little bit more concerned about that we might just have um, enough in a, of an uptick in updraft size um, to produce bigger hail than otherwise expected. But let's talk about that second component of the, the proportions problem, right? Updraft depth, uh, because we know that deeper updrafts can produce larger hail. Um, but when we talk about updraft depth, we got to make sure that we use the right parameters for this. How tall could a storm ultimately become in this kind of profile? Um, a lot of folks might be conditioned to use something called the equilibrium level, or the EL, uh, which is this kind of height right where our parcel path intersects that temperature line here, um, usually right around the stratospheric inversion. Um, and this is actually kind of the region where your anvil typically forms and flattens out as it hits that inversion. But it's not actually the highest that a storm can go. Um, because, right, we still have a lot of buoyancy and a really strong vertical acceleration um, right when we hit this EL here. Um, so our storm can actually bump up all the way to the MPL if it wants to. This is the maximum parcel level. Um, this is actually not used very frequently in severe forecasting, but you're going to find out that in hail forecasting, it really comes in handy. Um, and so this is really the maximum height at which our updraft can reach um, after it gets kind of decelerated by all that sin in the stratosphere here. Um, so what I did here was color the updraft um, parcel blue here, uh, where it is above the hail growth zone here, um, so where we can actually get hail growth. Um, so you can see in this case, we have a really deep portion of our updraft um, that can um, be favorable for uh, hail production. So let's contrast that with something like this, right? You actually have a really high equilibrium level in this case, so why are we only making it up to 8, 9 kilometers or so? This is a really classic uh, late summer kind of Midwest mini supercell scenario, right? Where you have really weak storm relative inflow here, and then you have kind of dry air in the mid-levels here. Um, so with entrainment, right, and once we get e-cape on the board to help us with these forecasts, our parcel path might be a little bit more something like this, right? We're not going to make it all the way up here. Um, we might just do something like this. And storms that fail to, to reach deep enough into that, that hail growth zone simply won't produce hail. So these might be horribly inefficient at producing hail, and oftentimes uh, these mini supercells really pose uh, primarily just a, a rain threat. Um, along with a couple tornadoes, if they're strong enough. But now, let's take this, this mini supercell here, and we'll lift it up into cooler temperatures, right? So our, our freezing level is naturally going to be lower in this case. Well, now here, intuitively, you can produce hail. Uh, because, right, even though you are shallow, a lot more your updraft depth is above that freezing level. We're colder, um, and so most of our updraft spends time in that hail growth zone now. So what we see here on the right is a plot of all hailstorms here um, and their most unstable parcel level, right? So how tall these storms actually got and then colored by their freezing level. Um, so you can see here, let's just make this a little bit simpler and just focus on these two areas that I've circled here. Um, these storms were 16 kilometers deep and you can see their freezing level was roughly around four kilometers or so. Um, so fairly high. Now, let's go down toward our storms that were only 10 kilometers deep. Now, we're working with freezing levels that are under 2,500 meters. So, right, if we have a shallower storm, like our case um, that we just talked about, now we need a lower freezing level to get the same hail potential with this. Um, so, in order to get hail, then, shallower storms need lower freezing levels. But, what else do we see here in this plot? 
Do you see this line kind of demarcating the, the lower limit of hail size with each um, storm depth here? Well, if we look at this closer, what this really is telling us is that MPL serves as somewhat of a limiting factor on hail size. Um, so whereas one inch hailstones can be produced by storms as tall as 18 kilometers or as short as eight kilometers. But if you want these bigger and bigger stones, right? Maybe say a five inch stone, you need a storm with an MPL of at least 12 kilometers here, right? You just can't get hail this big with the shallower storm. Now let's go all the way up to our seven inch stones here. And you can see there are no seven inch stones produced by storms any shallower than say 17 kilometers. So what, what this is telling us is that deeper storms can produce larger hail and that this is kind of a limiting factor on hail size. And quite interestingly, up to this point, we really haven't found any sort of parameter that, that has this kind of relationship with hail size. Um, so whereas we shouldn't use MPL to say, okay, if we have a higher MPL, we're going to get larger hail today. But it's more so a, a potential. It's a, if we have a really high MPL, given the right storm, given the right storm relative wind profile, buoyancy profile, and a storm that actually reaches this high, we could get very large hail given this high of an MPL. And what's really interesting is even though we're conditioned to use CAPE to predict hail size, CAPE just doesn't have this relationship with hail size. Um, so, right, there, there's, no, there's no limiting factor here for hail. And as we saw earlier, the, the CAPE for um, hail environments really depends on the shear and the relative humidity. Um, so CAPE really has, is not that strong of a relationship with actual hail size and especially its potential size. Um, so a way to kind of show this graphically then is, right, if we have shallower buoyancy profiles like this one, we're limited to smaller hail. Uh, we're generally not going to see really big hail with this kind of sounding. Whereas this sounding here, we could still get small hail, and, and most of our storms might only produce small hail, but we could possibly get much larger hail. Given the data that we saw here, a uh, higher MPL here and a deeper buoyancy layer has the potential to give us much larger hail. So lastly is the problem of storm relative inflow, right? We talked about the, the vertical momentum with that low level buoyancy beneath the hail growth zone. And now we're going to talk about the horizontal momentum from the storm relative winds. And so we know that storm relative inflow actually has a positive effect on, on hail storms, right? It can support broader updrafts and those broader updrafts can in turn produce larger hail, but there's a caveat to this, right? Because we know that storm relative inflow can also produce bad hail trajectories in our storm. And so let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail and, and kind of see what's going on here. If we have really strong storm relative winds near the ground, that's going to impart a really fast momentum on that little baby hail embryo here before it even reaches that hill growth zone. Um, so now, right, if we're, if we're already cruising at 40 knots here, right below uh, the hail growth zone, once we enter that zone, we're still going to be moving really quickly in and out of that updraft here. Um, so, right, that, that strong momentum, thanks to that low-level storm relative wind, um, is what's actually causing the storm to travel through the hail growth zone too quickly. Um, so in this case, we're really limiting the resonance time that we have within that storm. But now let's contrast that with something like this, right? We have only 20 knots of storm relative inflow this time. Now our stone, our stone can spend more time within that hill growth zone and within that updraft. It doesn't really have any place to be too quickly, um, and we can actually spend time growing within it. Um, so right, this is this is a problem of of both those um, momentums added on um, to these hailstones when they're in the hail growth zone, right? If we have too strong a vertical momentum, um, we're going to not spend much time vertically within that hill growth zone. And if we have too strong of horizontal momentum, we're also not going to spend enough time within that updraft uh, before we fall right out of it. Um, so in this case, uh, we need both of our momentums to be kind of moderate. Um, we don't want these to be too strong. Um, so what we're finding then in, in a large sample of data then is that if low level storm relative winds are strong, then it becomes even more necessary to limit that vertical momentum from that low level buoyancy.
Um, so when we have really strong storm relative inflow here, we need to have lots of sin here. We need to have um, a, a minimized cape here uh, below that hill growth zone. And here you can see how this relationship works with the broader sample of hailstorms that we studied. Um, you can see we, we put a 0 to 1 shear on the y-axis here, and then we put 0 to 1 storm relative wind on the x-axis here. And a lot of our early trials and tribulations were trying to figure out, okay, which of these is more important? Is it that low-level shear, or is it the storm relative wind? And what this plot is telling us is a couple things. First off, it is the storm relative wind, uh, because we're seeing most of the change um, in our low-level buoyancy profile with the storm relative wind and not the, the low-level shear. Um, and most importantly, what's, what it's telling us is more specifically, when we have stronger storm relative wind here, uh, storm relative inflow, um, we need weaker and weaker cape below that hill growth zone, right? This is this is sub hill growth zone cape. This is cape below that, that freezing level or that, that negative 10 degrees Celsius line in this case. Um, so when we have stronger storm relative wind, we necessarily need to have weaker cape um, below that freezing level to be more supportive of hail. Um, so this is what this would look like then in a, in a graphical sense, right? If you have really strong storm relative inflow like you would in this case, um, we would really need a sounding that looks something like this, right? With maybe a, a higher LFC, a lot more sin here, um, such that weakens that cape below that freezing level. Um, whereas a sounding like this, right? We have not only strong horizontal momentum, but we also have strong vertical momentum. And that's where we kind of overwhelm our hail embryos and really don't give them enough time to grow. Um, so if we have strong horizontal momentum, we generally want weak vertical momentum. Uh, we can't really have both at the same time. Um, this is not going to be a very favorable hail sounding. Now, what if we had really strong buoyancy here beneath the freezing level and beneath the hail growth zone? Well, in this case, we're going to have to do the opposite. We're going to have to want weaker storm relative inflow here, weaker storm relative winds, and a smaller hodograph here. And so it, this is a, a special case because you look at this kind of hodograph and now we're going back to the concept that smaller hodographs are mainly only supportive of mini supercells. So now how do we even get big hail with this kind of hodograph? Well, even if we have smaller supercells, if we have enough storm mergers, right, we can get a big enough storm that can actually produce hail with this. Um, so whereas it's a little bit more difficult to get big hail in this kind of sounding with our weaker shear, we could still get hail. Um, that is quite large given a sufficient amount of storm mergers and a broad enough and deep enough updraft. So for review, we talked about a few new parameters that we could use to predict hail. Um, that are different from those that we currently do and have a little bit more of a, a physical tie um, to what's actually going on in the hill growth process. Um, so for starts, we looked at e-cape, right, as this, this kind of more accurate version of cape um, that could also give us more accurate measurements of, say, cape below the hill growth zone or the MPL height. Um, so this is going to be something that in the future we're going to um, make good use of and kind of assume as our, our more accurate cape profile here. Um, and so we also talked about storm depth, especially above that freezing level, right, where hail growth can actually occur, um, and then up to even the MPL, right, higher than that equilibrium level, but all the way up to your MPL. Um, and so depth actually seems to serve as a limiting factor for hail size, um, where deeper uh, cape profiles here and higher MPLs can kind of serve as a warning sign that we could get larger hail today. Um, whereas shallower depth uh, might really limit the size um, that hail could actually grow. Um, and we talked about our storm relative inflow. It's kind of being a double-edged sword, right? It supports wider updrafts, but it also induces bad hail trajectories that stunt hail efficiency. Um, so when you do have strong storm relative inflow, you might want a sounding uh, that has weaker cape um, below that hill growth zone, right? If we have strong horizontal momentum, we want to limit our vertical momentum below that hill growth zone. Um, whereas if we have strong vertical momentum below that hill growth zone, we're going to want weaker horizontal momentum below that hill growth zone. We don't want both of our vertical and horizontal momentums to be too strong um, in the case of hailstorms. So now let's go through some case studies uh, that kind of give us a better kind of essence of uh, what is a hail environment versus what is a non-hail environment.
Um, and so a lot of us as, as forecasters have noticed that hail and tornadoes kind of occupy different portions of severe weather events. Um, what I mean by this is a lot of times hail reports kind of congregate near the dry line um, and occur a little bit earlier um, than tornadoes, which occur kind of after all the hail reports have stopped. Um, and I know a lot of uh, Storm Prediction Center outlooks that generally have the highest hail probabilities, um, especially right near that dry line. Um, and then all the tornado probabilities are shifted east. Um, and there is a rhyme and a reason for this. Um, because, right, what kind of environmental changes are we looking at um, especially if, if, if we want, per se, a tornado outbreak to happen. Well, generally we want stronger low-level buoyancy for a tornado event, right? We need stronger moisture, um, stronger three cape, right? All these are, are, are good parameters um, for outbreaks of tornadoes. We also want much larger hodographs, right? With, with stronger low-level shear, stronger storm relative inflow over time. So generally then, in, in a true Great Plains um, outbreak scenario, um, you're generally moving from an environment that might be a little bit more favorable for hail, right? With weaker little shear, weaker storm relative inflow, and maybe a little bit higher LCLs, maybe some sin here. And then you're slowly progressing toward one that's more tornado supportive, right? Um, where, in this case, this really strong storm relative inflow then, this really strong low-level shear, um, and this, this strong level of buoyancy here, over time is going to start to hinder hail potential. Right? And, and ultimately, um, especially as tornadoes really start get, um, getting going, um, right? our strong mesocyclonic um, um, circulations and our strong updrafts associated with these tornadic supercells are really going to kind of squash that hail potential once these supercells really get going and, and start producing consecutive tornadoes. Um, so this, it's kind of a yin-yang relationship, right? If we're favorable for hail, we're generally a lot less favorable for tornadoes. And then once we start getting really favorable for tornadoes, our hail growth might even shut off almost completely. Um, and so here's a really good example of uh, right our, our classic kind of southeast U.S. outbreak scenario where you have really strong low-level shear here, strong storm relative inflow. So you're going to have rocking low-level mesocyclones um, with anything that does produce, say, a tornado. And your, your horizontal momentum is just scary strong, um, as well as your vertical momentum here, right? We have a lot of three cape. We have a lot of cape below that hill growth zone. Um, so this is just going to be very difficult to get really any sort of severe hail from a sounding like this um, because we're dealing with both of our momentums in excess here. And so you, you could go in entire events here without hardly seeing any hail. Um, and I would almost bet you that a lot of the, these three hail reports um, were actually kind of north of a, a front that I know occurred on this day. Um, so, right, and then here's another way that you could get kind of a, a tornado-only event um, is during our, our summer months in the Midwest, where you have our, our smaller hodographs here. Um, our storms are not going to reach that equilibrium level. Um, we're going to be relatively mini um, and not have the updraft mass or the depth, um, especially in the hail growth zone, to produce hail. So now let's contrast that with probably one of the more, more classic ways that you can get hail events um, in, in West Texas here. I mean, you can see a smattering of significant severe hail events. So these supercells were very efficient and reliable at producing big hail. Um, and you can see, unsurprisingly, right, we have relatively weak storm relative inflow here, strong straight hodographs here. Most of our shear is in the upper levels. Um, so we're not dealing with strong low-level mesocyclones, and we're not dealing with strong horizontal momentum here. And we're also not dealing with very strong vertical momentum, at least below that hill growth zone, right? We have a high LFC here, relatively low freezing level because we're higher elevation. And look at all that cape above that hill growth zone now. Um, so this is just, this is a, a nearly perfect cape distribution um, for big hail events, right? Weaker cape below that hill growth zone, stronger cape above it. Um, and so we could still um, reach some pretty deep storms here. Our MPL in this case might be approaching 15 kilometers um, that are very efficient at producing large hail. Oftentimes though, the planes do like to make scenarios where you can get both um, significant tornadoes and significant hail here. Um, this was one such day. This was in uh, uh, May of 2016. Um, so the, the tornado hail combo here out in the plains is often created with a sounding that looks something like this. Um, you have relatively moderate um, cape below that hill growth zone here. Lots of cape above it. 
and you have relatively weak to moderate storm relative inflow here. Um, so even though you have a, a strongly curved hodograph, like, like one that would really be good for tornadoes, you are cutting down on your storm relative inflow here near the low level. So this is going to be a little bit better for hail production. Um, and so, right, this is kind of our, our default mini supercell sounding because we have such weak storm relative inflow. Um, but if you look up this day, I believe it was May um, 22nd, 2016, most all of these cells here, um, the top one uh, was in one of my gifts that I showed earlier, um, were created by a bunch of mergers coming together, right? So if we have really weak storm relative inflow, the only way to get a, a, an updraft that's big enough um, to support a significant tornado and a significant hail threat would be due to mergers. Um, so you see it sounding like this, and you think we still could have the potential for significant hazards here, um, especially if we had these mergers uh, to create big enough storms. Um, and the Midwest uh, can also get these, these tornado hail combos here, especially um, kind of in, in the early seasons or off seasons, right? This is um, an early March sounding. Um, and even though we have really strong shear here and strong storm relative inflow, like it might be in, in a vacuum uh, pretty unfavorable for hail production. Um, if you look at our skew T, this is a different story, right? We have a relatively deep K profile and we have minimal K below that hill growth zone because our freezing level is naturally lower, right? We're colder. It's, it's early March. Um, so oftentimes our, our early season setups are a lot more efficient at producing hail, even in strong shear profiles, simply because we're colder and we have a lower freezing level. So now let's look at some different types of hail storms and which storms are associated with severe hail. Um, oftentimes, severe hailstones are actually formed by elevated storms, or storms that are elevated above a stable layer or, or north of a warm front. Um, and these actually make up a significant portion of our severe hail events. Um, and so in this case, our hodograph here has excessively strong storm relative inflow. This would not be a very good candidate for severe hail production because we simply have too strong of hor or horizontal momentum here um, below that hill growth zone. Um, but let's say now that we were elevated above that shear, right? We're elevated above the stable layer and most of that storm relative inflow is in that stable layer. Um, so now if we kind of cut off that little part of our hodograph, uh, since we're really only starting our parcel at about one or two kilometers or so, now we have a much more classic straight, um, moderately sheared a hodograph here that is very favorable uh, for hail production. Um, especially, right, with our, our minimal cape below that freezing level, um, but our huge stockpile of cape above that. Um, this was a really deep cape profile, even being elevated, um, so we could produce some pretty large hail out of this kind of sounding. And so you'll start to see then that hailstorms really are associated with elevated storms quite often. Um, and right, even if we're kind of north of a, a boundary or a cold front, um, this is a very a common way uh, to get hail environments. You have kind of a storm riding along a cold front or just behind a cold front. Um, and so, right, this is going to create a scenario where your storm is elevated, but it's still being maintained um, by that strong frontal forcing. Um, so you could get um, some pretty significant hail um, given this kind of scenario here with this front. Um, left movers, uh, we also know to be more efficient at producing hail, and there's actually some research going on right now about why this might actually be. Um, but fundamentally, and the, really the only thing that I, I feel comfortable telling you at this point, um, is that left movers just have weaker mesocyclones, right? We're not going to see a left mover produce a long track EF4 tornado, um, so generally they're going to make better use of the environment. Um, they're not going to have such strong updraft accelerations, and they're going to be, by default, more capable of severe hail production. And we talked a lot about cell mergers, right, and how important they are for the hail ecosystem. This was the Hondo, Texas record hailstorm. Um, and you can see that all of these cell mergers came together um, before that huge hailstone was produced. Um, and so cell mergers are really important because regardless of the shear profile, they can help create bigger storms that are more mashous, they're more broader, they're more deeper, um, and these can all uh, more efficiently produce larger hail. Um, whereas, let's contrast that with, say, a mini supercell, right? These are usually limited in their hail size um, and can usually only produce smaller hail. Um, let's take a look at what the sounding for this looked like. We had pretty weak um, storm relative inflow here, right, at less than 20 knots. 
I mean, you had actually a very good um, cape distribution, right? You had weak, very weak cape below that freezing level, um, and most all of your cape was above that hill growth zone, but this profile was shallow, right? So we're only supportive of shallow storms in this case and smaller storms in this case. Um, so we're mainly only um, dealing with a threat for smaller hail in this case. Um, and a lot of folks ask, well, how do, how do you get accumulating hail? Um, well, that's actually pretty simple. It just depends on storm motion, right? If we have a really slow storm motion here, in this case, we're only 14 knots or so, um, our storm is going to be moving pretty slowly, um, and our hail core is going to be sitting over the same area for a longer period of time. Um, so sounding like this, this was actually a very destructive um, hail event um, down in southern Texas here um, because we had those really deep profiles for very large hail, and we also had a slow storm motion. Um, so this is almost as bad as it gets in terms of, of impacts to a, a specific area, um, and so this is what you should be looking out for for that. So finally, let's go back to the beginning and, and kind of revisit our Texas State record hail sounding. Um, because if you remember, there's a lot that we didn't really find impressive about this kind of sounding. And, and really, it, it seemed kind of normal. Um, so, you know, now that we've discussed a lot of, of the, the physical properties of hail and how that might relate to the environment, um, I'm wondering if there's anything about this sounding that might jump out to you a little bit more. Um, and there is actually a lot to like about the sounding. Um, right off the bat, we have a really deep cape profile here. Um, it's not overly excessive, right? Um, there's, there's not excessive cape below that hill growth zone. Most of our cape is above that hill growth zone. Um, and our parcel path, especially our MPL, could be well over 15 kilometers. Um, so we're already setting the stage um, for a potentially really deep updraft, um, given the right storm morphology. Um, and so coupled with that, we have a pretty strong shear profile, and we actually have quite strong storm relative inflow um, in the low levels here. Um, so this is going to be a double-edged sword. It's going to um, set the stage and help support um, a potentially very large supercell, um, given the right scenario here. Um, but it's also going to induce those unfavorable uh, horizontal momentum um, uh, in terms of suppressing our hail potential. Um, but let's take a look at our, our low-level cape here below our hail growth zone. Um, this is relatively more moderate, right? We don't have extreme cape here. Um, we have a relatively high LFC here and then kind of marginal um, lapse rates here. Um, so that's going to help us cut down on that cape um, below that hill growth zone. Th this is kind of all right. Um, I think this, this could definitely get the job done, um, especially coupled um, with that hodograph here. Um, and so you can see from the photograph that we have weak streamwise vorticity here. Um, so we're not going to be dealing with um, an environment that could uh, sustain very strong low-level mesocyclones and, and strong upward acceleration here. Um, so really, the, the environment seems to be set um, for this kind of event. Um, but what I really think kind of helped us actually realize this, especially with our, our strong storm relative inflow, um, is that we had a lot of cell mergers, right? This was, uh, I can count seven or eight different storms here, all merging into one. Um, and that's exactly when that giant hailstone was produced over Hondo. Um, so, right, this is just, um, the, the environment kind of, in my opinion, serves as kind of a, a setting the stage for this possible event to happen. Um, whereas these mergers helped realize this event. Um, right, We took an environment that was supportive of very deep, wide updrafts, and we actually made that happen with these mergers. And with that, I thank you for watching. I really think there's a lot of work to do um, in terms of how we communicate hail potential and, and what, what ingredients we should even be using in the first place. Um, and, and all I talked about today, right, we're, we're going to go through the iterations, or we're still researching this. These are not all set in stone, but they're concepts. They're, they're physical properties that can affect hail formation. Um, so as, as we continue in our, our forecasting journey, um, we need to better understand what we should be using um, to predict big hail and how we can communicate that potential for big hail. Um, so thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something today.